And okay, so we are live. And first, I'm going int to I'll, I'll introduce you, and then I'll let you introduce yourself. So we had last week uh, on Monday we had the German atheist. I got a lot of comments from you that it can't be better than we have, even better of the godless community. One half of the non sequitur show is here in person to tell us about his spiritual experiences. And you may know him as Steve McRae. He calls himself an agnostic. Is that still correct, Steve? Yeah, it's still correct. Okay. Uh, don't let that fool you if you are an atheist. He is one of your big guns in the fight um, against religion. And he's one half of the non sequitur show. And let's have him introduce himself right now. Well, hey, first of all, Craig, good to see you again. It's been a, it's been a while. Um, you were on the non sequitur show, I believe. I, I don't remember the topic you were having. You had a debate with um, uh, Thomas, uh, Holy Kool Aid. But I, the topic oh, was was it uh, religion needed or is good? Was so that, that was? was one. I've been on a few times. I've been on, I think. Yeah, you've been times. on a few times. The last, the last time though, I, I, I think it was Thomas though. But anyways, good seeing you again because, like I said, it's been a while. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what the goddess community is. Is that a, a name that you've given something? Well, because I just, I just titled you "Leading Light of the Godless Community" okay. because I didn't want to say "Leading Light of Atheism" because <laughs> I know there's you don't necessarily call yourself an atheist. So we'll get into that in a bit. But before we start, um, there's a couple of things about you I don't know. Um, so tell us, start from the start from the beginning. Like, how did you, in terms of uh, your relationship to non-belief? Um, well, well, how about okay. I kind of tell you how I, I got into belief to begin with? Go ahead. Because wherever uh, you want to start. Yeah, I um, you know, I never grew up religious my mom was jewish my dad was protestant we've had you know various other denominations in my my family my brother was kind of jehovah witness most of them are protestant or baptist or methodist kind of kind of across the board but we never really were a religious family by any stretch of imagination and i would go to a couple you know christian things here and there but never really was interested in matter of fact every time they would kind of pray or anything like that i just took kind of a a leave of absence at that point, you know, and excuse myself from the room. I just I never had a desire to, to get into religion. But when I was about uh, 17 or so, um, I was uh, at a, my ex-girlfriend's house, and the two missionaries there were going to give her mom a blessing. And the way they do is they anoint uh, the person's head with oil, and they, they give a little prayer and stuff like that. And they asked, you know, would you mind... You know, praying with us and being part of that uh, little um, blessing. These are Christian missionaries. They were Mormon missionaries. missionaries. They were Mormon missionaries. Okay. So yeah, and and I remember distinctly, I was sitting on the couch, and they said her name, and as soon as they said her name, like my whole body was just like lit up like a Christmas tree. It felt like like it was just uh, it wasn't a painful burning sensation, but it was just very very lit up. As a matter of fact. I remember distinctly that I could not, I couldn't see like my eyes closed, but it was like if somebody put a very bright light up to your eyes and you know how you can see the redness of your, your interior of the lids of your eyes. That's what I saw. Uh -huh. I, I could literally see like somebody was putting a bright light to my eyes. Um, and then they said, amen. And that it just went away. And I also felt like I was like lifted up, like literally like I was kind of moved up from my, uh, you know, off my, off the couch. And I, and I, and I said, whoa, and they looked at me like kind of weird, and I didn't really say much. But that, later on, I asked them, you know, I, what, what what the heck was that? And uh, they they were talking about the Holy Ghost and all that. Well, I, I decided to take the missionary lessons, and I actually got baptized Mormon. Um, on that predicated on that distinct feeling. Wait, right? wait, 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 slow down. You got baptized as a Mormon. I had yeah, no idea 17. about any of this. Wow. Okay. All right. Keep going. And. Wow. Yeah, and I wasn't really active um, that much, um, but you know. So I, what I would know. you before before you go on? What was what, you that experience was convincing to you at the time? Correct. Yes. That's why you joined up with the the squad. Yeah, that was the only. Wasn't, yeah, because that was it, the only. The experience itself telling enough to impress anybody of any ulterior reasons. 
for joining. Well, more. I did have an explanation at the time, right? I mean, I, I I went by their explanation, right? Because it seemed like the logical thing, or at least at the time, that it was the rational thing. Okay. So go ahead. Go ahead with this. So, um, you know, that was my that was my only you know spiritual experience that i've ever had where i said okay well this is something that i'm actually feeling that's a tangible thing so let me run with it and then at about 2008 the the church and again it wasn't really active i went to the military joined the navy as you know and became a, a nuclear propulsion supervisor for the navy and um throughout that time just just put it to the side i mean i never forgot the feeling but it just the whole aspect of the church just didn't really appeal to me that much, I guess, anymore. Uh, matter of fact, I got to tell you, I mean, I never really had a connection to like the Book of Mormon. I read it three times. Never thought it was that great. Um, never had this relationship with Jesus. Never had this relationship with God. Just that, that's not feeling that I had. And um, in 2008, when the uh, church started to uh, get involved in politics by funding these, these uh, Prop 8, which was the, the, Barry's proposal in California. Um, I was very much against it. Then I read more about it and I found out they were giving money to the Evergreen Project, which was a project that believed in reparative therapy or, or conversion therapy, which is basically making somebody who was gay trying to get them to be heterosexual, either by um, electroshock therapy or by prayer. Um, may have been some drugs. I, I don't know. But it doesn't work. It's a, it's a pseudoscience. And the, the, who, who, who exactly... Prop 8 was, uh, I vaguely remember that. That was the game. Was a yeah, it was a California initiative on the, on the ballot, right? Right. And it was, it, and so the church that you were involved in was. Mormon Church gave a lot of money to, uh, to, to go uh, against Proposition 8. Right. And that, you found out about that and that you didn't like that. Right? Well, actually, I think it was the other way around. They were, they were, I, 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 I'm trying to remember the actual proposition. I don't remember the proposition. Right. It doesn't, it does, it doesn't yeah. the, they, they were against gay marriage. You are right. pro-gay marriage. Absolutely. So you're kind of uneasy about them taking their stand. Yeah, and I don't believe right. that church should be involved. I'm, I, I believe in secular society. I believe I don't believe a church should actually get involved in um, in political matters, right? Especially when they're along the lines of something dealing of that nature, and especially to the point where they're funding it, right? I mean, I just, I believe in a very strong separation of church and state. Right. Okay. We're, but keep going. We're still in the, we're still in the story stage. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I basically at that point, I really had a major disconnect with the, the church at that point. And then, you know, I never really formulated my theological positions. I first, when I first got on the, the YouTube scene, um, I had my channel five years. I, got, I started my channel in March of 2013, so it's been over five what, years. What, was it was it as a form now where it was like atheists coming on in debates, or was it something different when you No, started? no, no. Actually, um, by the way, Sigart notices that you do have some static from your mic that I pointed out earlier. So, um, Is it bad? Ask him if it's bad enough that I should switch well, he can probably hear you. Oh. In the chat. Hey, Cy. Si. Um, I like Cy Art. Great guy. Um, one of my favorite theists. Um, so I thought I was just, wait a minute. What do you mean? One, okay, one of one of. I have, a, I have a, they're not exclusive. Um, he's my favorite theist with a PhD in biochemistry. How about that? <laughs> uh, no, actually, uh, he's he's your he's one of your favorite theists with the P. No, all right, all right. Yeah, actually, 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 he I'm is lying. one of them because I actually really like F Dr. Fuzzrana too. So. I don't know who that is. I don't Dr. Know. Fuzzerata, he is with Reasons to Believe. He works very closely with Dr. Hugh Ross. Oh, okay. And, and both of them are friends of mine. Matter of fact, uh, Dr. Fuzzerata, three times now, he's actually taken one of the questions I've either posed to him or somewhere on my Facebook, he's taken it and actually made it a question of the week. So um, I was really appreciative of that. Plus, he actually sent me one of his books called Dinosaur Blood and the Age of the Earth, and he kind of asked me to kind of look it over from a layperson's perspective. Because anybody can ask for a book review, right? But people know that I'm not an expert. They know that I'm a layperson, but they, most of the people don't think that I'm an idiot. Um, so he wanted to kind of get my impression of the book from a, from a person who is not, um, you know, a biologist or biochemist. And, and I thought that was pretty cool. And then, Do then Dr. Ross sent me a probable planet for kind of the same reason. So I I'm thrilled to, to kind of do those things as a layperson. Because I think when you write a book, it really matters more what the layperson thinks. Of course, you want it to be correct. And you want it to be, you know, I, you can't have a really peer review, but you want to be reviewed by your peers. 
But if a layperson doesn't understand their book and that's what the book is kind of tailored to, then what good is, is it, right? And I thought Empowerment Planet was very good, by the way. Um, right. And I thought Fuzz Book was really good. My only criticism, me, criticism me, is Fuzz Book is really small, but. Okay, but, one thing before, before we go further, because I didn't get to this yet and I'll forget. What is your actual education background? Or do you have a PhD? Because no, I no. always think that you I don't do. even have a degree, man. You don't even have a, a, a no. degree past high school? Nope. Wow. Wow. No, I, That's I, so I have, how I have, you, how Well, hang on. I have 120 plus college credits, right? I mean, I have okay. enough for a bachelor's degree. So in essence, I have the equivalent to a bachelor's degree. I have a lot of credits toward nuclear technologies, but I didn't finish my degree. There was a couple more classes I needed to take. Um, I didn't finish those classes, so I didn't get my degree. So I'm un uh, uh, undegreed or non-degreed. But that doesn't mean that I don't remember the information that I took, because I took a lot of cor college courses. I took macroeconomics. I took uh, critical thinking. I took music theory. Um, I took accounting. And then, I, of course, I took a lot of core stuff. So I took you know, calculus and took physics. But I also had about 60 credits or so through Naval Nuclear Power School, which is about about an associate's degree towards nuclear technology. Uh, most of the people okay. that finished their degree in nuclear engineering didn't have to take that many more courses to finish their degree in nuclear engineering, but I didn't take those courses. So, no, I don't have a. I, I, it really amazes when people so think how, that I have a degree. I don't know why. How, how, because. You, so, uh, let me just speak. Oh, you strike me and many people as very well versed in some of at least the things that you are talking about. Um, so are you mostly self-taught? What is this through just reading online or going to different sources, library? Or how, how, so where's your where's where's the body of your knowledge coming from? Just well, I mean, growing self? up, I was always I mean, I was kind of the spark in the class, right? They call me the professor, right. and I really happened okay. to like math physics. Can, and I was actually see that. I was sitting in college level courses when I was like sixteen. I was reading at a college level when I was in grade school. Um, I scored a 99 on my ASVAB, a perfect score. So, I mean, all my life I've kind of excelled in the intellectual department. But then, you know, you go to nuke school, and the nuke school is the top, I don't know, 1% of the military, I guess, really. Um, you have to have at least, I think, an 85 to get a nuke school. And most of the people, if you have less than a 95, you're probably going to fail out. It's, it is, I, and I hate, I, don't, I never really toot my own horn, but I got to tell you, it was rough. It was hard. Um, it, it, anybody who thinks that Naval Nuclear Power School is easy needs to try it because it is not like college. College is a breeze compared to Naval Nuclear Power School. Matter of fact, it's designed by by MIT. They take literally, you know, five course credit co courses. Like like uh, you take right. like calculus is a five, worth five units. They take five, you know, those types of courses and they compress it down into one day. And you have six months to learn it. Then you have another year and a half to actually apply it. So it's a lot of freaking work, okay. but um, you know, you, so when I got to nuke school, I realized that hey, these people are smart. I actually got an average score. I was basically 3.0, right, straight down the line. Right. Um, I think I even got a 2.95 on my final, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's passing, right? You had to get a 2.5 or higher. People didn't. Um, in fact, the highest grade in our class was a 3.6. So what does that tell you? So yeah, sure. it's a hard it's a hard thing, but I realized that you know what I, I I'm not as smart as these motherfuckers right I'm just not, um, and then when you get on YouTube you're around people that are degreed and are intelligent and you realize you know what you don't know jack shit um, but you enjoy listening to them and what I did over the last four years is I listened to people and right. I gleaned so That's much right. information from it and then I would go validate it on my own I would go look at. Um, Google Books and go read things. If, if a friend of mine would tell me, hey, in philosophy, this is like this. Okay, I would read the thing seven or eight times before I kind of understood it. But I wanted yeah, to no, understand. I definitely, I definitely think Twitter opens you up. Uh, Twitter with YouTube combined especially opens you up to a whole, I mean, there's a whole avenues of exploration that I hadn't even considered before I got on Twitter. And, you know, I'm not necessarily well versed in them now, but but I'm um, heading, you know, necessary about in terms of just whatever the stuff that we discuss, apologetics, things like that. Okay, so go ahead. Where where were we with uh, where were we with the story? Um, so you when it comes back, yeah, coming back to the um, you know me leaving the church, um, you know, and going back to you know me having my YouTube channel. 
you know, I listened to the atheists and theist arguments, and um, you know, I finally reached a position. I, I first said that I was a an apatheistic, agnostic, um, theological, and a cognitivist, and I eventually whittle that down. Yeah, some people never remember that back in the day. But but then I look more into it, and uh, I'm not a theological economist any longer. I mean, at the time, that position kind of makes sense to me, but as I look more at it, it, I realize it doesn't make sense, right? So it's one of those things that you change your position on, which I think is something that a lot of people don't do. They get fixated in some type of ideology, but they don't change it according to what they learn. And as I learn more about propositions, and I learn more about what a theological narcotivist actually is, it's not exactly what I was thinking it was, and I realized that's not exactly my position. I, that's the position where propositions don't have a value that can be assigned to them. They're not truth apt. That's what a non-cognitivist would think, right? But I do think right. that these pr- propositions, like I- at least one God exists, I think you can assign a truth value to that, right? And if you do, you're called a theist. Right. So that's that's fine with me. If somebody wants to assign a truth value to that, that's a theist. If you assign a false value to me, that's of an atheist. That's what it is in philosophy. In any kind of formal academic settings, when you're talking about theism or atheism, it is if you assign a truth value to that, you're a theist. If you assign a false value, you're an atheist. I don't so assign you, either. So you started your channel out and you are you are what is it is an exploration and you haven't taken a position is that how is that what you're telling me when you when your channel starts and yeah, tell me when, when kyle comes on board and, and why yeah when uh, i first why? started my channel, like, all of, when i first started my channel it was all about um uh debunking younger creationism right and that was that was where I started. A, My very first hangout basically was debunking younger creationism. Okay. And um, again, I knew the topic pretty well because I, I had dealt with them before on AOL and things of that nature, but nowhere near the knowledge level I have now. Over the years, I've, I've really <laughs> gained a lot more knowledge on how to really debunk younger creationism, but I had a decent understanding back then. Um, I even had an um, interview with, uh, well, it wasn't even an interview, just a one-on-one with uh, Ken Hoven long before he came on our channels. I mean, he's been on my channel like a dozen times, on the Nan Sequitur show a couple times. Um, rumor he has that he might, broke up he might be coming back, people. Might, maybe, don't put that out there yet. That's a secret, but we're working on something. We're making magic happen, if anybody cares. Um, Wait, say this all again. Paul, Paul from Paul Agia? No, Paul no, Paul? no, 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 no. Uh, Ken Hoven. Oh. oh, 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 okay. Yeah, I thought you said we're gonna see what we can make. We, we're gonna we're gonna see if how uh, I don't know. We're gonna see if he's desperate enough to, to try to come back on or something. Well, we'll give it a shot, okay. right? But um, long story short, <laughs> come in. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know if he's coming back yet. Nothing's confirmed. So this is our secret. The four people watching this, secret time. So. Um, Hey, bad tempered badger! By the way, in the live chat, I pay attention to the live chat when I do this. I know a lot of people don't like to. I like. I I, I can't. I try to, but I get too. It befuddles me too much. It gets too many irons in the fire. I'm very like if I if I do too many things, I start to just spaz out and get confused. So, I'm tr- I try to, but I can't. Uh, but badger, I like. Badger's a really good guy, actually. What's up, badger? Is he there? Did you not hear me? Can you not hear me? What did you say about Badger? I thought you were talking to Badger. No, Badger in the chat group. I like Badger. Oh, yeah, yeah. Badger's yeah. a good guy. Um, and so, uh, anyways, like I said, you know, I'd listen to these arguments, and I, I, I wasn't convinced by any of them, right? And I thought back to yeah. when I had my spiritual experience, and so I was always hanging on to some kind of agnosticism because, you know, um, I, I tried to, to, to ground myself for that. Hey, I felt something. I don't know what it is, but I felt something. But then I realized, well, people feel something all the time. I mean, everybody seems to have these weird experiences, but they all go to different directions. They all go to denominations. If you ask a, you ask like a fundamental evangelist Christian, they'll be like, well, that couldn't have been the Holy Ghost because you were with Mormons, right? Because they don't even think Mormons are Christians. And then you ask somebody who's a little more um, open-minded, they'll be like, ah, you know what? The Holy Ghost can open in, in, in work in any kind of situation. And then you have some that say, well, that's not even what the feeling is. There's no consensus, right? And I like consensus when it's dealing with empirical type things. And so well, I have to chalk it up to different extent. something else. I, I don't know. I still don't have a full explanation for it. But not having explanation 
does not mean that it had to be the Holy Ghost because I have no way to relate it to that. Matter of fact, my position was if God wanted that, me to have that experience and it be the Holy Ghost, he, was, he should have made it in a way that I couldn't even doubt it, right? I mean, it, it, it couldn't even um, second guess it because I had somebody else had to tell me what it was, right? I didn't come up, I didn't discover it on my own. And that I think is a problem. When you don't discover an attribute of something on its own, like what the Holy Ghost, whatever property would have, and you're relying on somebody else to tell you what it is, then you don't really have um, that discovery element, right? I mean, like, like all the properties right. of God, nobody's a, nobody's ever discovered a property of a God. It's all been delivered to us by other people, right? I mean, th think about this. Right. Everything we know about a deity, the one, the, the deity you believe in, has been told to you by humans. They've assigned characteristics that they wanted that deity to have. And that's why, you know, so many people that have written for the Bible, but that's why you, you find so many different types of versions of what a, the God is. God's hateful. God's loving. God's good. He's, he's, he, he, he's not good. He's bad. He's this. He, anything you want to find, it's there, right? Because you had so many people writing. And so looking back, you know, I go, okay, I'm, I, I, what is my actual position? You know, I, I am kind of apathetic. And that when I mean apathetic, I don't really care so much about the existential nature, of if there's a deity or not. That's not why I go to YouTube. I like the dialogue. I like the, the, the argumentation. Exactly. I, like, I like that. I like the, the organic conversations. And I like people having good arguments, whether they're on one side or the other. And I, I am pretty fair. Most people probably tell you, ones that actually bother to listen to what I have to say, I'm pretty fair in my application of being critical across the board. I don't play tribalism. I don't capitulate to any particular group because they happen to disagree with me. No, um, I do my own thing. And sometimes I get shit for it. It happens, right? But I'm not going to stop being that way because that teaches me how to grow. Because over the four, last four years, um, four years ago, dude, you would have thought that I was a philosophical idiot. I was. I, I mean, I was like, I was the kind of person out there going, ah, philosophy has no use. It's, you know, a bunch of guys sitting around smoking cigars, drinking single malt scotch. You know, that's it. And then I realized after a friend of mine who has a PhD in, in philosophy kept kicking my ass that maybe I Just should. Just four this. years ago. Just four years ago, yeah. I never, I've never taken a single philosophical course in my life. I took all science courses. I took biology. I took, uh, I took like, uh, intro to astronomy kind of courses. I love the sciences, but I didn't bother with taking any philosophy courses. Everything I learned about philosophy, I've learned on my own. But in that brief of a time, because I would have thought that you were at least a layperson in philosophy going all the way back to your 20s at least. Oh, no. Four years, man. Wow. Okay. You know what that reminds me of? I don't know if you listened to, I had a chat with Renee. Do you, do you probably know Scott Clifton? Yeah. Right? Uh, of course I know Scott Clifton. Yeah, um, theoretical bullshit. Do you know him? Theoretical bullshit he's known by. So, uh, for, yes. Um, yes. For a while, I was friends with him last year before he became, uh, right before he won his Emmy. And I, I was chat with him a lot on Twitter. And he, now I immediately, just from my interactions with him and from watching his channel, I was convinced without asking him that he had a PhD in philosophy. He's a, he's a high school dropout. Yeah, so no, he's he totally, yeah. yeah. He has no formal education was, on philosophy. It blew when he told me that. I, I freaked out on Twitter. I think it freaked them out because I was like, "What the fuck?" I, I just want to show you that you don't need. I, I look at. I am a very big fan of people that go out and get an education. I mean, I am in awe when somebody says they're a PhD. My mouth hangs open. Right? I am actually intimidated still to this day. And how many dozens and dozens and dozens of PhDs did I talk to? A lot. And I'm still to this day this amazed when I get a chance to talk to them, especially when, like the other day, I was talking to a Dr. Um, Kroon, who's an astrophysicist, and we were just shooting the shit, like, uh, like, uh, like on, on um, Horizon, uh, there's a Horizon problem, and we're talking about cosmic inflation and all this other shit, and I, it was just like, I'm talking to an astrophysicist about this stuff, this is great, right? Never would have happened years ago, right? It's only because of the great debate community and YouTube that I got lucky enough to meet people that have you know, gone that far in their education, and I applaud that. Um, I don't ever want to be held to that level because I didn't get well, to that. Probably also, what's that? So, what's going interact with 
what's going on is a bit of an organic process because you're on these debates all the time, which sharpens your mind, and then you're dealing with high-level people at least some of the time. You mentioned Ken Hovind. Okay, he's not the highest level. But then you're dealing with PhD people. So it's sharpening your intellect, and it's, it's at least teaching you the language. And once you know the language, you know that's half the battle. If you, if you can talk the talk when it comes to philosophy and people know you're not just talking shit, a lot of times it starts to sound really informative or, or really, uh, it starts to sound really high, high brow. And, very um, I, and I get that. And, and, you know, I, I, what I do is like on a non sequitur, I kind Would of you say that was correct or no? Yeah. Yeah. Things get a high brow pretty quickly, right? But I, like, I try to, I try to bring things down to a very normal level, like I would have understood back before, you know, I got into the, like reading about philosophy and stuff, um, or any other topic. Science, it's science too. Like I have a decent ability to to listen to somebody who knows science really well, and kind of parse it out to be able to explain it to the average person. Um, and yes. that's kind of what I do. I would on, say, there. I would say, totally good. I would say totally those those conversations and your and your live chats. On the after shows, the conversation go into terror too esoteric and while to spill over and tend to listen to the same one, where it just gets too theoretical. But for the most part, you guys, both of you actually, and Kyle too, do a really good job of grounding it back, bringing it back down to the, you know, to where the audience, you're not going to lose people in the audience. Right? Yeah, right. And, and that's a concern we have on non sequitur show. We want to be able to diversify to a large group, right? I mean, obviously, um, we can't please everybody, and and Kyle and I are both aware, well aware of this that you are never going to please your entire audience. And the reality right. is that if you please about eighty percent of them and twenty percent are unhappy, you know what? Such is freaking life. That's the way it's going to work on YouTube. Um, and that that's not across the board, but I mean, a single video, one person may say, "I hate that video," but I love the next one, right? So as long as they're having videos they do watch, it's gonna it's gonna equal out, right? But like the videos that that I like, people don't really have an affinity for. Matter of fact, Kyle's and I's favorite videos are not our top videos, believe it or not. Right? What, are, wait, what, are your, what are your guys' favorite videos? That's I like that's videos, actually... like, I gotta tell you, like, I love the coin videos, like, with, with uh, Nick, the uh, the numisticist. I'm just fascinated I'm... by that shit. This absolutely blown away. Yeah, oh, they're great. They're great. He, he talks about the, the coins from the Greek era. Um, I, I just, and I, I love Dr. Misha coming in and she talks about Czechoslovakia. I like to, when, jo you know, when Dr. Bowen comes in, he'll talk about a seriology. Those are the ones I really like. But of course the dumpster fires are the ones that get all the views. Right. So like it's the way it is. Rob, that type of thing. Is that yeah, what you and, mean? I love R2. I, yeah, I mean, R2, I absolutely adore. Um, you know, and he's a great guest, fantastic guest. Um, and those do get a lot of hits, right? Um, the dumpster fires are not the ones that people are going to take away something education-wise, right? Something edifying. So to me, I just happen to like the education ones. It's just personal preference, right? That's it. But we have to do a mixture of everything, right? Right. And I totally agree. Yeah, and that's just the, the way to. That's what it is. I'm not sequitur. You're never going to know what you're going to get. One day it could be a dumpster fire. The next day it could be a highbrow conversation. But even then, like you said, it doesn't get too highbrow. When we when we get to that level, we kind of go to my channel because. I can bring in more of a, a select group of people that may know the topic and we can kind of get in more in depth. Right. And that's the ones I like because that's the ones right. I learn, you know, right. and, I, and I wish more people would get more in depth in my channel. Cause I'm like, Hey, you know what? I want to learn this stuff. Go ahead, man, get in depth. And if I got questions, I'll ask, which I always do. <laughs> well, right. Well, that's why I wanted, I originally, when I had Sears on, I said, I wanted you and Sears to come on at one point and talk about, go in depth into either epistemology or morality and it's still an open invitation so if you guys want to do that yeah the, um, the, morality, the morality topic though is rough because um a lot of people use these words differently right and even i do not have a firm grasp on the whole moral content discussion it's rough it's a not an easy discussion and i think it goes awry actually, really quickly. that's why i wanted you you personally that's why I called when I was had Sirius on the show because I thought the, you, there was a brief period where you guys were with Stephanie, and there was a period of about forty minutes to a half an hour where I thought it actually started to get productive. I know exactly what you're talking about because you can get bogged down in even what subjective means versus objective, and yes. how people hear subjective can get really, really confusing. 
but I thought that your your take on morality, um, and I don't know if we should definitely we should go into this now, but I thought your take on morality could get very productive because I got what you were saying, and I thought we could you be so it's. Or well, I appreciate that. I, I try. I, I, I try to break it down where people can actually understand it. Although I get things wrong quite frequently, right? But the difference is when people of a of a of a caliber that know the material correct me, um, I don't pull this. Oh, I'm going to push back. I'm going to be like, well, what the hell? I got wrong. Even if I was right, at least I'm going to take pause and go, okay, what did I get wrong here? I want to I want to think this through. Like the is ought. I still have a hard, hard problem with Hume's uh, is ought. Um, it's it's a difficult concept to get. Uh, I'm still working through it, right? So. That discussion I, I kind of backed away from because I, I didn't know enough about it to really dive into what the isot is more than it just being a hidden premise that exists in there and dealing with normative qualities and, and, and other qualities. It just it's a very difficult subject that I just I'm not gonna ever get good at. So those things I, I steer away from. The only time I'll get into a discussion with a PhD where I really don't think they're correct, nine times out of ten, it's gonna be an area that they're not an expert in, right? And that happens uh, uh, more than that I could probably say sometimes. Um, but at least then when they say, you know what, that's not really my area, I'll go look it up and they'll come back, hey, you know what, on that particular issue, you were right. Um, so it can't happen, you know. Right. Now, the uh, um, the, the thing that I was going to tell you, because you just made the first time I was on, I liked about other, was that that was the first time that I, as a theist, ever felt like I was talking talking to people interested in getting at the truth or having a real conversation or they weren't you guys were not just trying to like shut me down and like shut me out you were trying you were you were taking some of the things i said to try and expand the conversation mm -hmm. so i was impressed the first time i was on the show and i thought you guys were pretty much that. fair pretty much fair as far as uh evil atheists go i thought you were some of the you're not even an atheist but yeah, I'll get into that uh, Some a little more. Of yeah. And I appreciate that. Look at my, our goal on the non sequitur show is not um, to um, not to um, play this game of gotcha, right? We'll be very fair until somebody we right. think is getting to the point where we believe they're being dishonest, right? And and Aaron gets to that point pretty quick. He he'll like call somebody out. Right. Look at you're at the point where you're not even listening. You're dishonest, and he has every right to, and I think he's right. You know, he, at that point, what are you going to do? We do the same thing, but at, initially, we'll give people the benefit of the doubt, and we want to hear the conversation. If you're an honest person who honestly has a belief, then I'm all for that. Let's talk about it, right? Uh, nobody in the last five years, well, I, I've had my channel five years, but I've only really been doing videos for like two and a half. But I was commenting on other videos for five years. But nobody's ever heard me ever bash somebody because their actual belief, right? I've never mocked Christianity. I've never mocked somebody's fundamental religious ideological beliefs. What I mock is things like flat earth. What I mock is when people say the earth is 7,000 years old and then they give the most stupidest reasons for it contrary to science. That's the stuff I mock because that's science. They're offering that as a scientific thing. They're not offering it as a faith base. They're not saying Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, fun. That's a faith thing out of my area. You know, I'll let the, theolog the theologians deal with that, right. right? But if you tell me that the that the Earth reigned for you know seven thousand or seven days for forty days, whatever the hell it was, and all the animals that exist, and all the plants that exist, and all the extant life that exists came from a ship that was floating all that time, that's no longer a religious belief to me. That is a that is a legit um, attempt to try to make a scientific that's claim that I call okay. bullshit on. Right? Do you see the right. difference? Okay, what's happening there, though? See, the difference is, and this is kind of, I guess, why. There's two things I want to say before I go into this. First thing is, a lot of people will say, yes, I try to be fair, and yes, we try to have real conversations, but you guys actually kind of follow through on it, as far as I was concerned, from my experience. Um, you can hear me, right? Yeah, from your experience, uh huh. Uh -oh. oh, oh. Okay, because um, the last time I was doing this. Um, the other thing, so you guys actually follow through on, is that if, if someone is making a claim that is not, that is more fact based, then yeah, you gotta you gotta be able to back up the claim in terms of fact based. Like if I would if I were gonna present this, I've even said this to the to the Noah's Ark Christians themselves. If you're gonna say like the Earth is six thousand years old, okay make your case to these 
people and convince them the actual concrete reality. You know, yeah, all no, of a sudden I, you're in an area exactly. of conversation. Yeah, they. That's so exactly. It. You're perfectly. Well, like, you're perfectly legit to challenge at that point. Whatever. If I say, you know, um, this is America doesn't exist. <laughs> to say, I throw that out there. America isn't isn't actually a place. Okay, prove that with actual evidence that I can latch onto or go away. Right? Is that is that kind of? Yeah, yeah. Look, if those things are scientific claims, right? If somebody says like though, like Jesus rose from the dead, sure. Somebody could say, well, that's still a science claim against the ontology of the universe, saying that you know, it's not. we know, it's we like, know that you, the person can't. Yeah, but but I take yeah. I, I, when somebody when somebody at least says, look, we're taking it as a faith based claim that it was a miracle. Science has no say on it any longer, right? I uh, again leave that to the theologians. But when you say right. that, and I'm not you because I know you're not a younger Christians, but when you say that. Um, you know, all life came from the ark. We can test that. You know, and, and it's not, they're not—they're not saying that's a miracle. They're not taking that as a miracle position, right? That's a huge difference, and that's why when, right. I, when, no. when, I, when I go after young Earth creationism, I'm not going after a person's faith. I'm going after their scientific claims. Right. They're saying evolution is wrong. The substance—if—if if, That we're, we're basically, if you're making an outlandish, substantive, empirical claim that belies common sense and basic understanding of reality, for example, America is not a real place, it's an imaginary land, then you have to back it up with concrete reality, evidence, empirical evidence. But when one of the things that you guys understood innately, which I've had to try to explain to other atheists, when you are having a theological discussion, that's a totally different thing. Yes. Then you, agnostic or the non-believer, can enter into discussion as if God really exists. You don't have to believe that God exists in order to discuss his attributes or discuss theological. Well, you know, if I say God is good, a, a theological conversation without you having, you can just for the purpose of the conversation, you know, agree that, you know, to have the conversation as if God is real. You guys understood that. A lot of atheists won't won't do that. You know, they'll they'll keep trying to beat you, quote unquote, in the conversation and kind of try to beat you over the head. So there's no point in really discussing anything. You know what I'm saying? Like if we start talking about some of the things we talked about on your show were like theological questions in nature. You know, is God innately good or does the, you know you know the questions. Yeah, no, and, and so, I, I, you know, here's the thing. I, you know, I, again, I can step into any position. If somebody wants to argue a theistic position, I can, I can, you know, hear them out. I can step into that position too. I can argue things like argument from contingency or, or argument from motion or any Aquinas five way stuff. Doesn't mean I think they're they're convincing arguments, right? But I also know enough to say, well, you know what? This is why they're not convincing. Um, explain why the argument of from the argument of contingency is nothing that gets you to God. At the very most, some of the stuff can get you a deist. Best case scenario, but it doesn't get you a theism. And I, and I know that Aquinas doesn't even think that it could either. I think he was using them all as, hey, look, I got all these different things I'm gonna throw at you and make a probabilistic argument that because of all these different things, there's a theist, but or a theistic type God. But I. Right. I don't know for um, sure of that, but that seems to be what his, his one approach was. One of the things that I, I talked about on my channel, and I'm going to go into this more, is that, and I'm sure you'd agree with this, the the most of your Thomas, and if Heather or maybe Cy, si, I don't know if Cy si is on board, Stephanie might, might think they're all good. I don't actually think that the cosmological arguments and the quote-unquote proofs for gods, I don't think they're sound. I agree with, I'll call you an atheist, uh, you the atheist in those, you know, uh, they're not actual proofs of God. No, the they're not supposed to be, though. Not I've supposed heard. To be. Uh, I think it's a misnomer when well, people refer they, to them as proofs. They, I know, they, I don't. They, they generally they're are. They're, they're they're generally referred to as you know proofs, right? But they're really not. Uh, I mean, they're well, just. Well, they don't because they're not successful. Right. Because they're they don't actually work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the best one I've heard of them is the one, the argument from eternal truth. And it's kind of a variation on the Thomas Aquinas one. It's in Phaser's Five Proofs of God. It's, I think, the fourth one. It's decent. Again, it's not a proof. That's the problem, is he's presenting, he calls the book Five Proofs of God. 
It's not a proof. If I said, if I can tell you the argument, you're not going to walk away from me telling you the argument going, wow. Craig just proved God is real. It's not, yeah, that's why I don't like the proof. Yeah. You know what I mean? It means it's been somebody based on. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't. I don't I, like I, when what? people call them the five proofs rather than the five ways, I, I, I just kind of take it back on that because they're not, like you said, they're not proofs. Um, and, and I think if, if Aquinas knew what we know now, he would actually think a lot of the arguments are bad. For example, like the argument from uh, causation, right? Um, that seemed legit to him at the time, and it, and it probably would be have been convincing to him and other people at the time. But the argument from ca uh, causation now isn't something that is unexplainable. Matter of fact, we know there are things that do not have a cause. There are effects without a cause. The law of cause and effect is not a real law. It's, there's no such law in physics called the law of cause and effect. Okay. Matter of fact, it, matter of fact, is a necessity in some aspects of physics and quantum mechanics I, I that that there is an effect without a cause because there's no cause to be had in order to make to have the effect. Sai, is he right? Is he is Sai is the reader? Yeah, I'm right on that. It's it, <laughs> the, 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 Sai, the, he's right. Sai, he's <laughs> right. Sai, leave him alone. He's a biochemist. What the fuck does he know about? He uh, knows. He knows. Sai, Sai, I'm kidding. Sai, I'm fuck that. Sai. <laughs> Sai runs circles around those jerks. So oh, Sai is freaking brilliant, man. Sai was kicking, I kicking everyone. I don't, know if, I don't know if he's familiar with this particular thing. I mean, this has to do with the uh, Copenhagen interpretation because um, the Copenhagen interpretation says there's no local variables in the system that can describe uh, such that you're going to describe all the states of the system. It doesn't satisfy the Bell inequality, right? And but there is something called pilot wave theory, which allows for global variables that that will work, but it's a lot more assumptions. Um, it does work, but it's not a it's not a local variable model. And if you don't have a local hidden variable model, then that means that inside that system, there is nothing in that system to tell you when a certain event is going to happen, like spontaneous fission or weak nuclear decay. There is no information in that system. It does not exist. There's no causality. That's a fundamental thing of physics um, in that model, right? That model could be wrong. You could, again, pl pl try to use... Um, Bowman mechanics or something, but under so the Copenhagen interpretation, you're, you have a what you're basically cause. saying. What undermines? So what you just said in brief undermines the whole premise of cause and effect, which, as yes. far as my layman understanding was, is that is the science, that is the root of the scientific method. So I, you just taught me something that I did not know. Sigurd says, yeah, stop it. I already said you're right, Steve. I agree with Copenhagen. Yeah, Sai's si smart. I mean, he's yeah, just, see? I, uh, God, it's just I know, si so intimidated by smart. Like si knows the deal. Okay, but, so, yeah, uh, but, okay, so getting back to that, you were relating that to, just to tie this back to what we were talking about, you were relating that to um, which one? The, one of the Thomas arguments for the existence of God, and the first premise being... Um, there's there's no such thing as an uncaused cause, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that whole thing is for like I, a prime mover, right? That's that, what you were relating this. Well, that's the, well, that's more the argument of motion, causing, right? The argument of motion basically right. is saying that uh, because we have things in motion. That's exactly right. One premise. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right, but the thing I was going to tell you, I take the atheist side on that argument is an assertion. It's not a fact. It's an assertion. You know, well, all these things. Well, 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 hang on. The, the thing that you got to recognize is that all these things are assertions, right? An argument is an assertion. So when you have like the argument from motion, you're just asserting things. As a matter of fact, I had somebody tell me the other day that my argument was flawed because I didn't prove the premises. Now let's think about this. Premises are are bit, things that you assume, right? You don't have to accept them. Uh, I think that's don't, actually kind of sketchy, though. No, some, it's not sketchy. Some, you, Aren't you there premises that prove your you premises? Choose. You prove the uh, argument by making the I'm assumption that the propositions are true, and that goes to the soundness of the argument. If it is a logically structured argument, right? If it follows some kind of rule of inference, it's like like, like modus ponens, right? That right. means it's, it's logically valid, right? So if I say something like, um, "If the moon is made of green cheese, I'm a cow. The moon is made of green cheese, therefore I'm a cow." That is perfectly valid logically, okay? It's a logical argument, and it's, it's perfectly valid. Right, right. Okay. An actual rule of inference. Because you're saying if if the moon were made of green cheese, then you would be a cow, and then you said yes. the moon is made of green cheese, hence you are a cow. Okay. Yeah, all that means so is that all that means is that yeah, the no, got, conclusion has to follow from the premises 
um, if the premises are true. That's all validity really means. But the right, soundness right. is bad because obviously the premises aren't true, right? And the mood is not right. made of mysteries. And I'm off that's to what I thought. That's why I thought you have to. You do actually have to either deal in a premise that everyone accepts as true, or prove the premise, don't you? If you don't, no, you don't the, prove the premise, you just accept premise. the premise. If I, if I accept that the moon is made of green cheese, then I'm a, then I'm a cow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because that's, that's the, the, the soundness of the argument. The premises are saying, if you accept all these premises, that if the moon is made of green cheese and I'm a cow and the moon is made of green cheese, therefore I'm a cow, you're accepting that those premises. But obviously I would reject those premises. So you can have a logically valued argument that's false. The entire argument is false, clearly, because the soundness is, is not good right right okay, okay. so so when you have premises again you, you you never prove the premises it's just like any assumption and they are assumptions you don't prove assumptions that's why they're called assumptions or presuppositions if you want so i thought it was right. really odd, odd when somebody didn't like the argument because they didn't prove the premises i'm like well why don't you tell me why you don't accept the premises because that's what i'm offering i'm offering you the argument by telling you what i want you to assume for the premises, and you got to tell me why you don't assume that. Why? Why are you rejecting the premises? That's how it works. But okay. they don't think that way for some reason. But like the argument for motion with the first cause, we know now that the that the, the initial movement may have been caused by what's called spontaneous symmetry breaking. Right? We 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 know now that motion is a lot more complicated than what Aquinas knew. We we know that time is a lot more complicated than what Aquinas knew, and so. There might be some other things. And by the way, you know, we might have discovered a fifth force just recently. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, he didn't he didn't know about these types of things, and so to him, it made sense for a causal relationship, right? You have this the regress of causality that you have something moving now, something had to have that move that and that move that, and you have this chain of causality. And uh, uh, the way I, he described it was, all motion is is just changing from from um, potentiality to actuality and so you have a potential state and by doing something with that potential state you cause an actuality you cause motion which doesn't work in quantum mechanics but I, I, again these are just these are really good arguments right, but time. to sum it up in relation to what we were just talking about the proofs for the for to the Aquinas proofs so you're basically saying that they they were good for the time yes Based on the knowledge that they're based on the knowledge that he was dealing with, they were excellent or really, really, really sharp, but they just don't cut mustard today. Yeah, yeah, oh, they're brilliant for the time. And by the way, chaos doesn't point this out very distinctly. He says valid and sound for deductive reasoning, cogent and weak, um, strong for inductive reasoning. I totally agree. There's one thing you're missing though. I would actually add in convincing. Um, I, I think a lot of people neglect that that convincing. Well, aspect. that's the key. That, okay, wait, that's argument. the key. Yeah. Okay, that's the key. Because the, 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 the reason why a Christian apologist presents these is because they are supposed to be convincing, and they aren't. And there's a bunch of different reasons that they're not convincing, but that's actually the key, because you're not just trying to impress you know, other Christians with your cool arguments, which sometimes it seems like that's what they're trying to do. You're actually trying to portion of is your revealed truth. I believe have truth. So my, if I'm to make if I'm to make an argument based on reason that I'm going to present to you, Steve, who doesn't believe me or agree with me, it's supposed to be it's for you. It's to point you in the direction of you agreeing with my revealed truth. If it doesn't do that, there's no point in doing it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, 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 I do, but the, the, I think that these things were designed more for the believer. I think they were uh, more designed for the person exactly. who already believed, not, yeah. not to convert yeah. the non-believer. Um, right. And especially nowadays, you, I mean, I, I got to ask my theist friends, how many people have ever really been convinced by Aquinas's five ways in modern times? I've never seen it happen. I don't see how it could. I mean, maybe it could. I'm sure Stephanie will get someone with it. Does Stephanie use it? Does Stephanie there? Stephanie will get someone with it. But other than that, nobody else will. But yeah, I don't, I don't see. To me, that's not really how how the whole deal goes down. But anyways, let's before we get go keep going with this. Let's go back into where we were with your. So we're in the two years into your channel, and you're where where are we at? Two years in the channel. When did you meet uh, your 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 co co worker? 
Um, oh, um, Kyle? Yes. Okay. Um, Somewhere along the way, your channel switches from you start to have a dog in the fight. Like you, As far as I'm understanding, you started out your channel kind of just sort of debunking young earth creationists, but you weren't necessarily taking a position on God per se. And then you start what? Okay, so Brian, basically, as you guys may have known, I, I was involved in a group called the Great Debate Community for, for quite some time. Um, there was... Uh, my my goal was to get the great debate community to be a great debate community to be kind of something that was known among YouTubers, um, somewhere where if you are a member of the great debate community community you stood out as somebody that could articulate arguments, um, or at the very least, go in an argument and actually do halfway decently. Right, you don't have to know this stuff, but at least have the wherewithal and the balls to go actually put your information out there. Whether you're right or wrong doesn't matter, but it takes a lot of guts to argue on air. It is not easy. No, it's not easy. And, and I, it, I, it, it, you're out there. You're putting stuff out there, right? Would you agree? Yeah. So yeah, it's, absolutely. It's a and, lot and harder, especially – it's a lot just from my own experience with it. Like what we're doing now I like much more, just like generally chatting about the stuff. But it's it, – there's a lot of different challenges that come that, – that you don't anticipate before you do it. It's a lot harder than it looks. And, you know, keeping your – keeping yourself calm and focused is – 85% of the battle in some ways. Go ahead. Um, yeah, and so, uh, you know, the Great Debate community was um, set up to do that. Unfortunately, there were some, some problems internally, some schisms. I wanted a different direction. I wanted to have a higher caliber. Other people wanted this more basal trolling, um, you know, make a response video and just bag on other people. And that bored me, to be honest with you. I, I didn't want to do that because anybody could do that. I wanted something higher. So no, there was a little bit so. of schism, that but you know what? It, it, it's fine because the Great Debate community now is stronger than ever. We've got uh, almost 1,700 members. We have, I would say, 50 PhDs and master's levels people. Um, we have some of the biggest name YouTubers in the skeptic community in the Great Debate community. But it wasn't the vehicle to take me to where I wanted to go because of, of some of the, the issues with it. Are there Christians in the Great Debate community? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. There's, oh, yeah. Considerably not Christians. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, my dear, my dear friend who passed away, Jade, she was a member of the Great Debate community, loved it. Um, I think Sigart is a member of the Great Debate community. Kay is a member of everybody, everybody in your live chat is a member of the Great Debate community, I think. I know SJ okay. is. So, yeah, I mean, pretty much everybody who watches these things is a member of the Great Debate community. SJ they may not participate is? much, but what? Yeah, SJ is too. How did SJ get a wrench? And she get a, a wrench on your channel. Because she was getting timed out maliciously, and I didn't think it was appropriate. And she's been on our channel many times, and I think she – we had to give a little – guidance, but I think she will moderate fairly, as long as she doesn't abuse it. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm giving her a wrench as soon as I figure out how to do it. I have no idea how to do it. I'm giving her a wrench. Mute everybody, Stephanie. Mute anybody who says anything about me at all. Unless it's totally positive. Mute at will. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and so, um, you know, Kyle was going to do this documentary on the Great Debate Community, and he said, Steve, you know, you're, you're the kind of the the host and the owner of the Great Debate Community, so I've got to get you in this documentary. He'd already talked to uh, Brett Keane, and he talked to uh, a few other people, but he's like, I really, really like your, your, your what you have to say. I like your videos. You know, you're on top of things, and you present things um, in, in a way that a lot of people can understand it, because Kyle is not a science person. His his expertise is, is like graphic design, and he's very creative. I mean, he's probably one of the most creative people that I've ever met when it comes to design. I, I could never do anything that he does when it comes to these layouts. He's just fucking brilliant. And um, I, I didn't have that. So, I, I mean, we, we, we started talking and he said, you know what? We need, we should do a podcast kind of thing, right? Forget the right. documentary. Let's, you know what? Let's just do a podcast. And I, and I said, I love it. Let's, let's just jump into it. And we started the podcast and that went over pretty successfully. Um, as as of today, we have over a hundred thousand downloads on our podcast. Cool. But but he didn't really want to get into YouTube, and I and I was telling him, no, dude, trust me, YouTube is where it's at because um, uh, I have a lot of friends on YouTube. I know a lot of people on YouTube. I you know I knew Arn and I knew a, a bunch of other big players. I said, you know, let's let's try it out. And so our first episode, we had Ken Hoven and Doctor Doctor Mays, right? Uh, um on a podcast just knocked it out of the park right because you know dr dr mays is a very brilliant biologist and kent well he's 
Kent. <laughs> um, but he's a big name, right? Yeah, he's, how did you get that big of a name that quick? Were you were you already well known because of the great debate community? Yeah, yeah, I already had some um, either popularity, notoriety, or whatever you want to call it from the great debate community. So people had knew who I was because I had had Aaron on my my show a few times or channel. Um, okay. I, I had uh, I had Kent on before, so um, I mean, I was hosting the debates with King Crocoduck and Ken Hoven long before non sequitur. Okay. And anyway, so so I realized that look, at, with the, my contacts and my limited amount of science and things like that, and Kyle's ability to market and make graphics and all this other stuff, we we have a winning formula, and we had a goal. So I got the brains. You got the looks. Let's make lots of money. Let's make money. That's I've, great. I've awesome. you know that? Yeah, that's a great song. Actually. Yeah. We might actually throw that on a video. Um, so. We we wanted to be bigger than drunken peasants, and and by the way, we already are. Um, because are they, you really? Well, they broke up, so that's we get more views than they get now because they broke up. So I, I, I it, by default, right? Um, and we were on drunken peasants the other night. We were on well, we were right. on the. I saw that. Wait, but, before yeah. you go on, who, what, what are they? Is one of them like the brother of the amazing atheists, or what's their? Yeah, TJ and Scotty were brothers. Okay, I thought and, so. And okay. friends with uh, Ben. Were him and Ben are brothers. I don't remember. I, I think TJ and Scotty are brothers, aren't they? I don't remember I, the family I, dynamics. I but anyways, really they, they all split up. And by the way, I, I liked them all. I was never a big Junk and Peasants fan to begin with, but I liked. I love TJ's monologues. I think he does some of the ex most exceptional on his own monologues, but I, I was not one of the DP crowd because I just didn't find the, the toilet humor any, any good, right? But I really liked Ben. Ben was really nice. He wasn't feeling very well, but, he, you know, it, it happens. Right. Uh, uh, SJ asks who broke up. Uh, D Drunken peasants broke up. But anyways, you know, we 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 got together and we said, you know, let's do the YouTube videos. So we started doing that, and that just took off. And people started liking the format because the dialogue that I I had envisioned for my channel for the Great Debate Community, that's what we put on non sequitur. These dialogues. Let's have the conversations. Um, I couldn't pull it off my own on my own channel. I admit that. You know, I, I tried, but I, I failed at it. But I did try. But the, the, the plans were there, right? I had the idea. I had the concept. Kyle had right. the other half of that concept. And so I was like, done, you know? And, you know, Kyle and I well, don't agree upon a lot of things. But we do, do agree upon the main things. And that's what I think makes the show strong. Well, you, you, you kind of innately agree on the concept of the show as far as I can tell you are broadcasting vision from this internal sense um, you probably don't agree on supplies you know I, I think that's what you meant you're referring to like things you don't agree with you know in the theological department but in terms of what you're putting out there it seems to me like you're both in unison or in unity is that true yeah, you broke up there what Oh, did I pick up? It seems to me like you guys are, have agree on the vision of the show itself. You guys are in unity in terms of what you're putting out there, what what you want people to see, right? Yes. Yeah, I think there was a demand for it. Because, um, again, all I saw was people just bashing on one group and, and picking on the, the slow people. Um, yeah, that's fun. Don't get me wrong. There are some people that call the clan car posse. I do enjoy occasionally. Um, throwing shit towards because they're just so stupid it's ridiculous but I can't make a whole channel out of that and I don't want to right I mean I want people to be edified they're not going to learn much by me just pointing out that a person who has no education whatsoever thinks that the earth is 6,000 years old right you know? it's it's actually it's not that fun it's fun in, in tiny it's like you know what it's like the uh, did you ever watch American Idol where they have the bad auditions right at the beginning you know, it's fun in small doses, but too much of it, and you start to get really sick of it, and hate right, yourself, exactly. for it. <laughs> and you hate yourself for participating because you get hooked up. It's like you know, uh, what was one of those stupid shows that used to be on TV? The, uh, the like those talk shows with, uh, with you know, the guy sleeps with his sister, and they come on the talk show. Oh, what, like what those? oh, that was like um, was it not, not Morton Downey Jr. but um, they like him, Corrado, I mean, yes. Rivera, and and right, uh, right. Jerry Springer, like, oh, that kind of stuff. Jerry Springer, that's the one I was trying to think. Guy's the mayor of like Cleveland or something. The uh, there's fun, they're fun up to a point, and then you get really sick of yourself for watching them and enjoying them, and they, it's the same idea. 
but your show is your show is sometimes like that every like once in a while but then you also go try to have more ambitious you know edifying discussions and debates right yeah, because I think that the discussions um, better suss things out, right? Because if you have two people that disagree on something, um, you you get a more diverse understanding of the topic because you're looking at it from two different points of view. Now, there are certain things that are not debatable. I've never labeled a flat Earth debate as a debate. Um, well, maybe maybe very early on I did. You know, people may find me in an old video of me saying debate, so I can't say that. But I don't now. Uh, call them debates because they're not debates um there is nothing debatable about flat earth right it's just yeah. wrong it's one of those things that it's not do you believe in flat earth is do you understand why the earth is not round that's the only question to ask somebody and i i'm the same way with young earth creationism there's no debate on that it's it's done deal uh it's wrong but if somebody wants to say let's debate about the nature of god fair game go ahead right um let's talk about morality fair game right these things are debatable because there may not be a set answer to it, at least that we're not that aware of. And I think the great debate question, which is the way the reason why it's called the great debate community, is the unanswerable question of God's existence. Um, I think that when people throw things out there like, "Oh, the great debate's over, God doesn't exist," or "The great debate's over, it's been you know established, God does exist," whenever I've talked to those types of people, none of them, for example, understand um, the, the 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 actual debate they don't understand the topic um and it's frustrating too because they they make these these proclamations with such a surety but then when you ask them to actually demonstrate in some conceivable way why they believe that they're justified all that position none of them ever do none of them that goes for theists and that goes for atheists alike now that doesn't mean that, that they can't give a good justification for their belief sure okay and might even be able to, to claim a knowledge claim Right? Possible. They might think that they're justified to call it knowledge. But when you say that the debate is over and you made a conclusive thing that has been troubling mankind for thousands of years, you know what? That's arrogant. That is arrogant to think that all these brilliant people that still don't know the answer to it, that have sit around and actually formulated these these types of arguments and formulated reasons against the arguments, to come in, you know, in 2018 and go, oh, well, yeah, we all know there's no such thing as God. It's like, no, right, right. we don't. Um, I, I don't know that. Um, that's, but that's one of the reasons why I'm agnostic. And that I didn't, I didn't realize I there were any, there what? were any atheists who were that that gung ho about it who would be like, "Oh, sure." There I are. guess I, I did. I guess I did know that. Never mind. All right, yeah. okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I did know that. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, a lot of people do, right? Um, they they think that um, by just by making a proclamation, it must be ontologically true. Uh, there's and there's a couple different groups out there that I noticed, right? I mean, you have your theist. Most of them will say, to some degree, a lot of it is based upon faith, right? I mean, the whole part of the Bible is talking about faith, right? I think that if you made a, a claim that you know something to be true, like the, the the God exists, where's the faith, right? I mean, you're making an epistemic claim that you need to show why you think you have sufficient justification to 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 say that, because everything you know about what you think you're worshiping could completely be wrong, right? I mean... Right, let me ask you a question epistemo epistemologically. Um, is there... what it, When you had your experience, your experience, by the way, the one that turned you into a... Uh, um, what was it? I'm about to say Muslim. You didn't become a Muslim. Mormon. You, <laughs> Mormon. No, <laughs> you not Muslim. A Muslim. You were almost a Muslim. Did any Muslims ever convince you of anything? No, um, no, I, I am not. Okay. A, I, I, you know, the, the, I was that people, the only. Uh, look, I, was saying, look, I, I do. I do believe there's. Was it my own experience? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. But I, I will say that Islamic phobia might be a real thing, but there's a reason for it. Um, you know, I, I think there are some dangers to certain religions. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, there's there's a PR problem in the Muslim community. Because like well, if there they, were, if they were famous, people, Christians yeah, that's were pretty famously bad. beheading people, yeah. you know, if Christians were like famously like in in like South South America, there was like Roman Catholic groups that were like showing on American TV, then like killing people. You know, there'd be a big problem in the Christian community, PR problem in the Christian community, and I'd have to address it probably every time I presented myself as a Christian. You know, look at the Roman Catholic Church; that's probably something that we Christians are going to have to talk about, you know, at least 10% of the time we're on air now because 
it's but anyways go ahead um was that the only spiritual experience before i asked you about epistemology? yeah yeah I mean, like i said that's pretty much it i mean i might have some of the minor things um but i mean the only thing that kept me that you know attached to theism was that but then i realized that doesn't get you to theism at most i i can say by critical analysis that i know now i felt something but the, who right. the hell knows what it was i mean i've I, I, I couldn't I can't make that connection between that and some kind of theologically sound thing like the Holy Ghost or anything like that. There's no connection to be had there, right? It's a jump so, in reasoning. What would be this what would what would it take for you, Mr. Like Lee Dog Agnostic, to be ep epistemologically convinced? What what do you think would 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 well, make epistemologically you convinced a is believe, right? Just so when you say epistemologically convinced, you just mean believe. Believe means to be convinced of something. Okay. So you're asking well, so me what, what would it take for me to believe? Or break down the epistemology so that so that a Christian could hear it. Like this is this is what this is what I, Steve, would need a Christian to Yeah, I would I would need something like a visitation or something. You know, I'm not I'm not one of those people there's there's, it, there's people out there that say, look it, God can come down in front of me right now and I still wouldn't believe it. And I'm like, well then you're an idiot. You know, I'm like, I don't, I don't think a lot of people would would believe would. They, they say that with broad bravado, right? But I think that if anybody had an actual real experience, if they did exist, they would not be so cavalier about it, right? Right, of course. So your experience and was real. Oh yeah, it was a real experience. Oh, there's no question about that. I, I know that and I. It was, there's no question about that. And it was inexplicable, inexplicable. to you. Yeah. But it's but it was not enough. To keep you in, a, especially when there were other aspects of the faith that you found personally unreal. Right, right. And if I had to ask, faith, why would God take me to this particular religion? By the way, I love the people. Um, my, one of my dearest friends I've known since sixth grade might be coming down this Sunday to, to, to visit with me. Um, I've known him like forever. He's still Mormon. Um, but, you know, I, I, I couldn't read the Book of Mormon and go, yeah, right. I accept the archaeology. I can't read the Book of Abraham and accept the. The readings by which they gave the papyrus, you know, from Joseph Smith and the pirate papyrus. Now, I'm not going to say that, you know, he was a complete fraud, such that he was doing it all for money or something like that. I don't think he ever made money off of it. I don't know what the reasons are, but there's all kinds of different leaders from all kinds of different churches, right? I mean, every church you can think of has some kind of leader attached to it. So right. Mormonism is no different in that regard, right? But you don't know their their reasonings why they do what they do. They could actually be real believers. They could be delusional. I have no idea. Um, but I couldn't take the the all the other stuff that I was associated with the Mormon Church from what they were doing and reconciling it with my own personal moral moral code. Right. Okay. So so that's exactly where what what I was getting. At. So let's let's say the same experience happened to you, but you joined the Mormon Church. And instead of them presenting you with the Book of Mormon, they present you with a more generalized philosophical book. Like, I don't know if you ever read the Tao Te Ching. Something that was more palatable, that you were like, okay, that's cool. Those are cool ideas. And then they did not necessarily war against your inner sense of right and wrong. They were, you kind of saw them as good out there in the world. You might have stayed in. Yes. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Fair no, to say? I, I, yeah, that's fair to say. Yeah, um, yeah, I think so because you know I I always had an affinity toward the church, um, and I like the church. I mean, I, I I people say Mormons are like a cult. They're not. I don't think they're anyway cult at all. I've I've seen cult mentality. The people in the, if you go to a ward in a Mormon church, they're the nicest people you want to meet. They they really do care about people. I've I helped them out with food banks. Um, never got into their cultist mindset. Never got into young with creationism. Um, never was indoctrinated. Right. I mean, it's just basically they said, OK, you want to know about this? Or we'll tell you about it kind of stuff. Right. Um, they didn't really care that much um, if I questioned or anything like that. It wasn't like you have to believe this or anything like that. I didn't experience any of that. Now, granted, though, and I will say this as a, say this as a qualifier, I was in California. And from what I understand, because I lived in Utah as well, yeah, Mormons in Utah. Hardcore, yeah, man. there's a difference between Mormon Utah and California Utah. And, and, and I probably agree with that. But I never really went to church in the in the Utah one, so I don't have first-hand experience. But I will yeah. say that's probably probably going to be true. Everything. My wife, my wife considers herself like a hardcore Republican. She's a California version of that, which means like you put her in like Oklahoma, 
she's she'd probably be considered like the biggest liberal in the world you know it's like that's how things that's how things are you know you get back with like the the bible people in the bible belt you know i'm i'm a california christian that's very different from whatever a tulsa oklahoma you know christian yeah no so that's, I'd imagine that's you well. definitely because the same uh, idea Especially with Mormon. Christians, right? Bible Belt Christians is going to be a lot different than what you find in Hollywood. <laughs> I'm right. Telling you. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. Like we we live out, in, you know, we live in in LA, so that's a totally different thing than people who, you know, part of it is a, is a whole. There's a whole cultural thing, you know. But keep going. Oh, I was just gonna say, uh, yeah, um, you know, so you know, to get back like into, into the church. Or any church, you know, I would need some kind of visitation or something like that. Um, something that I, I, I wouldn't be one of those people. I wouldn't be one of those people that go, "Oh, I'm having a delusional thing." Um, I'm pretty sane. I have never had um, any kind of um, reason to think that I'm not in possession of my faculties. Now, granted, I've had auditory and and visual hallucinations before because of sleep deprivation, right? Or really? just sleep paralysis. Yeah, I've had uh, sleep paralysis all, all my life, um, insomnia and um, uh, sleep. Uh, um, what they call it? Uh, not, I think it's sleep apnea. I think it is. Um, sleep apnea. But uh, I've had a lot of things, sleeping problems, right? And I've had times where I've had actual visual and auditory hallucinations many, many times. What's you visually hallucinate? I've actually visualized an actual demon floating, floating by my head, like in what? like full what? wingspan, everything. Weird. And, when? Uh, when you were when you were Mormon or no no this was after, uh, after you quit Mormonism. See six, six years ago. Got... This was six years ago. What'd you do? Did you pray against it in Jesus' no, name? No no no. Actually, <laughs> I was like, this is freaking pretty cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I, I had, you're like I, you're like an agnostic at that point. So like, oh cool, the devil. Well, yeah, because I've had so many experiences <laughs> yeah. that I've known that they're all in my mind, right? Um, and I actually there was one. I'll tell you this though. I had had. Um, a while ago, this was sometime, so many years, some years ago. But somebody had actually said that, "Hey, Steve, next year you have one of those, those, those hypnagogic hallucinations, praying the name of Jesus that it leaves you. You know, do a test." And I, and I thought of it from a scientific point of view. I'm like, "Well, what have I got to you lose, right? Right? Because I, when you're in a lucid dream state, you are aware. You can control your actions. Okay, they're amazing. I, I recommend anybody who who has never tried a lucid, uh, me, a lucid dream, go read about it. Go try to induce one. They're amazing." Absolutely amazing. You heard it here. Don't I, they say? Don't try it at home. Try it at home. Please. Try it at home. Try it at home. This this is, this is the new, not dangerous. The new cool drug. No one's ever died. Yeah, cool fuck drugs. Don't do drugs. You don't even need alcohol. Just just you learn, how to, need just learn how to do, do induced um, um, lucid and dreams. Lucid by dream. the way, I've, I've been able to induce mine five times. About it's not easy. So cool. that's how hard it is. Although I've had many of them, only five times or so have I ever willfully induced them. But um, I did an experiment. So I was in a, a dream state, lucid dream state, and these these entities were there. Wow. They're, they're, they kind of look like people, but kind of not. But I was like, yeah, whatever, man. So I was like, you know, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And they just looked at me like, what the hell is that supposed to mean? And I was like, ah, you know what? I tried. <laughs> you know, that was it. That was all it was. Um, so, <laughs> like, you know, we're I, I never get scared by anything. Name Jesus, we're I haven't had a nightmare in we're ages. ages. Yeah, nothing scares me when it comes to dreams because I, I – I know that it's all not real, so I don't can't remember the last time I had a nightmare. So you didn't think that that when you saw the demons, you didn't you didn't give that any sort of yeah because they were actual... I knew they weren't I didn't know they, they knew they weren't real, you know. Okay, so when you hear about like life after death experiences, are you kind of thinking that that's what's happening to people? Yes, their, uh, yeah. their brain chemistry is overflowing, and they're they're attaching religious significance to it because of the religion they were trained in i'd imagine that's how i it think that's more likely the case yes um I, I don't have any reason not to to believe that right but you are fair-minded enough that if you you're convinced your one spiritual experience was convincing enough that if all the other things were equal and you were you were you felt cool about the the church that you were part of you probably wouldn't have walked away from Yes. So that's that's something to keep in mind if you're a Christian listening to this. 
and, and, do a much and, better job and, and, of being good people all around. And I'll, right? I'll give you more, I'll give you some other since you primarily have, primarily have a theistic audience. I'll, I'll give them a piece of advice from from an agnostic. And and first, let me clarify why I'm agnostic. Um, an agnostic is is real simple. Um, a person who doesn't believe but hasn't assigned a truth value to the proposition of. Uh, uh, at least one God exists. Okay, so when you talk about like a lack theist or a, a, a person who doesn't believe there's a God, but claims to be an atheist, which is fine. That's a colloquial way of doing it. I reject that. Right? To me, not believing a God is not sufficient to be called an atheist. To be an atheist, right. you have to have a necessary precondition of not believing in God, but it's not sufficient because in, in academia, uh, atheism is the belief. That theism is false, or their their belief that there's no gods, right? That is that is straight up truth. Anybody who watches this video who doesn't believe that, go read a book on it because I'm not not BSing you. All this stuff you ever hear on YouTube and G Plus about oh atheism is just a lack of belief. That is wrong when it comes to philosophy. That is wrong when it comes to academia. It only holds true in colloquial terms. And if you want to use it, that's fine. But if a person tells you I am not atheist because I use formal definitions. Don't call them an atheist because epistemically they are not atheists. It's just as bad as a theist calling an atheist a theist because they know God because of Romans, right? So don't mislabel people. But let me give you the best piece of advice for theists. If you're going to convince somebody that what you're saying is true, stay away from these, these radicalized right. evangelicals that don't know what the hell they're talking about because they make all theists look bad. When you have people out there that are so damn dumb that don't even understand the most basic of concepts and they're representing theists, they make theists look stupid. Because my, my thing is, why is God using these people as their PR peers? Why is their yeah, is PR people? You are you like, even, you know, Psychotic I like, SJ I like. Good representations. I mean, SJ I think is a bad at her apologetics, but she's a good person, right? I believe she means yeah. no ill will. She has a good heart, right? That's fine. Yeah, totally. But these other people are duplicitous, man. Just duplicitous. Well, and they 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 give it's that's even in the Bible. You know, you just quoted the Bible. You said, "But because of you, my name is blasphemed amongst the Gentiles because of poorly, you know, Christians going out there not doing it correctly." But even worse than that is you got you know a lot of a lot of them. I don't I don't really want to go into because I don't want to bring them up. But you know, you got some people out there who were relatively famous, and briefly. Um, because they're making arguments that are actually really kind of evil or totally counterproductive to, you know, making Christianity look good or being an ambassador to Christ, let's say. Total counterproductive. Yeah, but no, yeah I, Stephanie, I totally agree with that. Stephanie yeah. and Cy are, are, are ambassadors for Christ in the good way. They, they're, they're presenting their case and they're trying to the best of their ability to be diplomatic and not hateful and, you know, put the best foot forward. Correct? Yes. Yeah, and like I said, I don't have to agree with them to recognize that. And I think that a lot of atheists right. non-believers make that mistake. And here's the thing. You know, I'd rather have somebody like Seigart that I know no science and that I'm just in awe of when it comes to his, his expertise. And I'd love one day to maybe actually talk about more about his expertise. I, we never really have, and I think it sucks because I really do like to learn a little more bio biochemistry. Uh, it's never one been a field that I never uh, really studied. And I never got good. I took a, uh, inorganic chemistry, right? I had to qualify secondary right. chemist. But that's all inorganic, stoichiometric chemistry, not the same as organic by any stretch of the imagination. And so I wish um, I could learn something from him like Vesper theory more. Like I had to learn Vesper theory and um, uh, Vespa theory, like the Vespa, like little mopeds. No, uh, when it comes to valence of electrons. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, I know. Like, yeah, I know really well. I know yes, really well. Balanced shell electron peripulsion. Yeah. Basically, when you're dealing with orbitals, you have sp1, sp2, sp3, and these are hybrids that exist because of the sharing of the orbitals of the electrons. And it's fascinating how it works. Um, and you, you look at the 3D modeling, and it's really awesome. I like that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. If if I can remember some of that stuff from its like first year stuff, um, I would be thrilled to have a conversation like that. But but long story short, you know, um, I don't have to agree with him about his theism to be for him to be an ally because we agree upon. The stuff that I agree upon the most, or that I want to agree upon the most, like um, secularism, uh, you know, get creationism out of schools, uh, teach evolution. If he believes in all that stuff, the rest is is gedunk. I don't care. He can believe Jesus walked on water, and I'll be like standing right beside him and going, "Go for it, buddy." Doesn't bother me, you know, because he he will say you cannot teach creationism in school. That's the thing that I'm concerned about, right? Right. 
No, I, t I totally understand. There are some things that are that are there. There you have core values and beliefs that. Uh, I'm afraid, but yeah, no, I totally understand. What you mean. There's there's things that are deeply important to you about yes. what we discussed, and there are other things that are, you know, they're interesting, but they're they're irrelevant. You know what they they they. Chalk them up to personal beliefs, and they don't contradict any of your own innate code of ethics. So you're like, whatever, live and live, live, you know, live and let live. It's not a challenge to. It's not. It's not something that you find morally wrong. Yeah, it doesn't affect my life if somebody has a belief, or that belief is false or not. As long as it's not encroaching upon the secular society, it is not my. In a way that you think is, it, it's possible. And let's let's see since since. You, you seem to be an agreeable place. It's possible that even we could we could encroach on secular society in a positive way rather than a negative way. You just don't want it encroaching in a negative way, interrupting what you think is proper science or you know trying to teach this in schools that you think is wrong. But it's possible that it could, you know, people could bring their bring their Christian values in a positive way, and then you'd be fine as long as you thought it was positive. Right? No, no, not really. I, I don't think it, it, it still. I don't. I don't think there should be any Christian values in school. I don't like the Ten Commandments in school. No, that's not what uh, I meant. I, you know, I meant. What do you mean? I that? meant. I meant like if I have. I'm. I'm a Christian. You're totally cool with that as long as my beliefs are kept to myself, or when they encroach on society at large, they're yes. That oh, absolutely. Positive. Sure. They're positive. Yeah, I, I mean, you that's only why object I gotta, to it when yeah, it's right. negative. Yeah, exactly. Uh, look, at, I know a lot of anti-theists, and, and I, the only way I stand for anti-theists is when people misrepresent anti-theism, right? Um, right. Because I, 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 I concur with, like, Gallus Cranium. His definition of, of anti-theism is what I use. This what most people use that read the, the literature. What's his? What's his? I don't know uh, what Anti-theism is. is somebody that's against the concept of God or against religion. It's not against God himself. It's not somebody who hates God. It's not somebody who believes God does not exist. Because I've heard people tell me, oh, Steve... You're so wrong. You cannot be an atheist who who says that you believe God does not exist because that makes you an anatheist. Well, no, it does not. Uh, uh, excuse me. They're completely different things. And so, oh, yes. um, there, I, uh, uh, cosmic skeptic made that mistake, and Goddess Cranium actually correct, corrected him on that. Atheism and anatheism are very different things. And there's such a muddy in the water when you're using these terms because people have used them differently. Like if I say strong atheist, that just means in the literature. An atheist it means a philosophical or propositional atheist that believes God does not exist. That's what it is. But Dawking, Dawkins took Dawkins took that and turned it into something else. He took strong atheist to mean somebody who's hundred percent sure there's no gods. That's not what it ever meant. Right. Well, with the thing that the one with the all that atheism means is a lack of belief in God. The reason why people were latching on to that colloquial definition is that it's much easier to defend. It's, you know, it, it's kind of a way of fudging a debate because I don't mind because I, I accept that if you want to say the burden of proof is all on me, that's fine. Um, but the reason why they, they would latch on to that as the definition of atheism is to, is to you know, it's much easier to defend in an in argument. It's much easier to, it's hard to win an argument against that definition because you can just, then I, I got to prove everything in the argument. Yeah, yes. Yeah. See, I, okay. First of all, I respect the theists because they will take on the burden of proof because they recognize that if they're going to say that something is true, there's an attached burden of proof. But here's the here's what a lot of people don't understand: the burden of proof in that situation does not mean that you prove God exists. A theist does not have to prove God exists to be a theist. They don't have to prove prove God exists to accept a burden of proof. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean to prove anything. It is an epistemic burden, meaning that they need to give justification to why they hold the position. Okay? It's not evidential uh, burden of proof. It's an epistemic gotcha. burden of proof. There's a huge difference. right? And I wrote a blog on this. If anyone wants to read it, you can go to uh, www.greatdebatecommunity.com, look in the philosophy section, and I wrote a, a blog on this particular thing, uh, Atheist and the Burden of Proof. Because uh, when you so confuse those like two, you, you make a, I'll link it to you. There's this huge difference between the two because if, for example, in a science setting, right, and, I, and I'm sure Sai will concur with this, if you say theory relativity is wrong, okay, you have the onus to demonstrate that. Nobody has shit else to do no matter what. If they disbelieve you or not believe you, they do not have anything they need to do 
in that particular case. That is a monolateral thing. That is a one-sided thing. Just like if you're when he when when Cy got his PhD, I'm pretty damn sure he had to stand in front of a bunch of people, or whatever review board, and defend his thesis. Right? Nobody on the board. Right. He couldn't ask any questions. They didn't get a, a, a. They they could have said whatever they want. They could have asked him whatever they want, but they don't. They don't. They're not the ones putting forth that 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 um, claim. They have no onus. But those are rare instances when you don't have an onus, right? Defending your PhD, submitting a, an, a claim against science. But when it comes to theological claims, when it comes to a, an interrogatory between two people, both of them come to the table. Both of them have a, a burden of proof, right? And for somebody to sit there and say, oh, well, I just don't believe you. I lack a belief. I got to tell you, most of the time that's dishonest because – I've known a lot of them have said that, but deep down they do believe that gods don't exist, and they're just trying to to get away from that burden and get because they don't understand that the burden for an atheist for a justification justification is pretty damn easy. I could make the burden, right? Of okay, course, for being a strong atheist, but I'm epistemically not that position, right, so but all, I don't do that. Right. But all I'm trying to say is that, and most of the atheist theist back and forth are unproductive. So there's a lot of different ways. But it, why they were why they would adopt a colloquial definition, even though they don't necessarily believe the colloquial definition, is that the the Christian will not, if you say uh, God doesn't exist now, I the Christian will start trying to bust your balls by going, oh yeah, prove it, and it and it become you know that's why it's much easier just to adopt a colloquial definition, even though it isn't necessarily all that accurate. Now, um, go ahead. Yeah. Um but the thing is, if, if I, I, I can recommend your your theist audience. Look, if you, you want to discuss these topics and you run across somebody that says, you know what, um, I don't have any belief or I don't believe you, um, blah, 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 walk away. Walk away. Say, okay, whatever. I, why the hell do I care if you believe me? Find somebody else. Yeah. Uh, and then the reason I, I say I that is because it's a waste of freaking time. It's a total waste of time. I agree with Steve time. completely. Listen to him. If, if, he's if, wise. There's a reason why he's in charge of and these to guys. The, <laughs> I'm not in charge of anybody. Nobody listens to me. Are you kidding? Um, <laughs> but, but I'll give advice to the atheists, too, that might ever listen to this. Think about this, atheist. If you are trying to convince a theist that your position is correct, and, and I'm, I'm going to, for, for, uh, because uh, our arguendo, I'm saying that atheism is a belief, because that's how I use the word. So however you believe it, that word is supposed to be used, that's up to you. But in my conversation, atheism is a belief. So... If you believe that there are no gods, why don't you make an? Why don't you provide an argument for that? Right? What's more convincing to a theist, uh, an atheist who says, "I just don't believe you," and you go, "Okay, who cares?" Or somebody says, "Hey, um, you know what, uh, Craig? Not only do I not believe you, I believe you're wrong, and I believe there are no gods. And here is my reasons why. It is more likely the theist will sit and listen to have that conversation and have the potential to no longer be a theist if that's your goal." But you're never going to convert a theist by saying, I don't believe you. Just or, never have have a productive or have a productive conversation. Right. Because the, the objections, if you say, I don't... This is part of why when, I, when I'm getting atheists on this show, is I want to start... I want to, I'm trying to dig in to try, not, not with you right now, but in general. I, I want to try and dig in and find out, you know... Why they became an atheist? You know, you got Godless Crane was on the show, and I'll probably have him back soon. He's good. You great. know what? Uh, yeah, he's a cool guy. Um, he's not Shannon, but he's a cool guy. Nobody's Shannon. <laughs> Yeah, no, nobody. Shannon, Shannon's the best. So, uh, I have to say that because if she ever listens to this and doesn't hear me say that, she gets mad and beats me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> she. <laughs> she. He hasn't. She hasn't. Yet. So, she what? GM skeptic video. I've listened to that, right? Pretty good. Jen yeah, yeah, good. Good. yeah, yeah. But but see, you know what? The, the people that you name, like, look at when you have Shannon, you have Apologia, you have Thomas uh, Westbrook, you have uh, Goddess Cranium, um, you've got Kyle, you've got um, uh, you know all these really good atheists that are honest people, right? But right. yet you have right. a group of theists out there that always talks about this this really mystical group out there of atheists that I don't know who the hell they're talking about. Now, there are some militant atheists that are oh, just stupid. Oh, they're there. They're there. They're out there. Granted, I don't know who they're talking about. Granted. They, granted. They, they bothered me. Yeah, no, granted. They, they, they do exist, right? But they always seem to either tact tactically or implicitly 
try to relate that small little militant type of atheist group, which I can only think of a couple of them, to the whole. And so they're saying, oh, all you atheists. No, 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 no. All those atheists that I mentioned, all the ones that you know deal with our little circles, those are good people. Um, oh, totally. Don't, don't, totally. And, and for them to lump them into get, the, these militant ones that I think are just assholes, um, that's not fair. Right, that's that's like saying, well, Craig, you know, you're a theist, so that must mean you're a younger creationist, or you know, something like that. Right. No, that's not what it means. Right. I, I said no, that. it's totally. I totally agree with that. The uh, and I don't do that at all. Like I, I make a big distinction between the cool guy atheists who I like and the dickhead atheists who are out there. Though they're out there, you know. There were times where I would put up a video. And people I don't know would just come and insult me for no reason. You know, <laughs> happened when I first got on Twitter. Now I know a lot of the people, so it doesn't happen that much. Yeah. But there used to be people who would come on Twitter just to bust my just to bust my ass, who I never met, I didn't know, <laughs> and they'd be like, oh. "Well, you're just welcome dumb, to my world. You know? Welcome to my world, brother. I got yeah. I got people that uh, I don't. Okay, it's it's kind of weird because. As you spend more time on the internet, more time on YouTube, you obviously pick up more subscribers. You obviously pick up more followers if you're doing something right. good, right? If you're doing something well. I'm at the point now that I just cannot remember everybody. And I can't respond to every cr comment that is left at this point. It's just physically impossible. And I'm not, no, I'm never, dude, I'm never near. You don't got time for these little people. No, no, please, no, please. no, 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 no. I, I, oh, I you're really that one do guy try. From that one debate. <laughs> you're that one guy. You know, one guy from that one debate where the guy's like, Steve, Steve, remember me? And you're like, oh, yeah, you're that one, you're that one dude from the debate last year sometime. Yeah, you know, what was that? Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. You were, the, you were the flat earth guy. No, 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 not that guy. No, you're the younger creationist. No, 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 that guy. Oh, okay. Oh, you're the guy that drinks piss. Yeah, I'm him. <laughs> okay. Because we have a few of those. So, um, you know, I, I do try to read all the comments. I really do. I spend hours a day. Just you got to look but I get people messaging me that I don't know, right? And it's fine. I want people to message me. I do enjoy it. But they think that I kind of like recognize their like Facebook name from their name they use like a live chat. And unless they tell me, I'm not going to put two and two together. So I'm like, who is right. this person? You know. But there's you know you deal you deal with a lot of people, obviously. So you got to practice the phrase, dude. I'm Steve McRae. I don't got time for people like you. A I'm just a nobody on YouTube. I'm, Steve, I'm not even. I'm, I'm a person. You're one half the non sequiturs. Well, still, but it's still. I mean, we're not. We're not like at that epic level yet. I mean, we're we're trying. Well, you'll be there. You'll I, I hope so. I really do. You've grown, you've grown pretty quick. So, oh, almost everyone in that crowd that you mentioned, they're, it, they're not just cool people. They're like the. They're going to be the big time atheists of tomorrow in like two or three years. Almost all the people you mentioned. Right. Yeah, it takes. It takes. Uh, I think we have. I think we have another year to go before we're kind of notable. Maybe two. Right. That's what I said. But all the people you mentioned, Godless Cranium and Shannon, and they've got like. Almost, I mean, he's got like twenty three thousand, thirty thousand subs. Uh, you know, Thomas Westbrook has like I don't know fifty. Uh, Rational Rules has one hundred and twenty or something. Godless. Right. Uh, you know, these and I'm, and they're all well deserved. Don't get me wrong. They're uh, every one of them. I'm not a hater. Right. I. I Firmly believe all, um, you know, high tide raises all ships, right? All boats. So, right. you know, if they get more subs, I get more subs, and if I get more subs, they get more subs because it, it's a small little community. So I don't right. get this little envious thing. Oh well, they've got ten thousand more subs than us. No, um, I, I'm happy for them because I know eventually I'm going to get some of those subs. Um, if you put out good content, we we just right. our biggest thing is the word of mouth. But like just today, somebody I've known for years wrote. How come I've how come I've never watched non sequitur show? This show's great. I don't I don't know <laughs> why haven't you right? I don't I who knows, um, but it's just word of mouth. That's all. The um, who's Thomas Westbrook? I don't actually know who that is. That's the one. Holy I don't know. Oh oh Tom oh okay I do know Thomas okay yes I know Holy Cool. I debated. That was my second debate, or the second debate on your show. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually it was. That was on objective morality. Um, no, wait, wait, did he, wait, did he talk to you about, object, no, he was talking to, to Greg Geiler on objective morality. Yeah, no, that, my, our, our debate was on, uh, is religion a positive 
Oh yeah, something it's religion like of positive force in the in the world. Yeah, something like that. What else do you want to know? I mean, I kind of like kind of skipped probably a lot of parts, but I mean, I, I do want people to know that people do have spiritual experiences. They need to, to kind of chalk it up to what they want to. This, um, so this is actually fun. We've been. You're, you're, is he breaking up, or is it just me? One one thirty seven. Okay, so um, a little. Should I switch to my phone? Oh, you're good. You're good. Fine. Let me see. Um, switch to my phone. Can you hear me well enough? Yep. Yeah, they say you're breaking up a little okay. bit. Okay. And I want to thank the four people watching: Psy, Chaosism, Mike, and uh, SJ. So thank you guys. I mean, the big turnout. But you know what? Four or four thousand. It's all the same. Um, I'm happy just to have people invite me on and um, have these conversations. Yeah, this was fun. People, um, there, there, there are people who watch this. I, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, the chats get views after the fact. Well, you're seeing a lot um, of people going, "Oh, well, you know what? Steve's just an atheist." You're, you're get, if, if an atheist watches this, they'll be like, "Oh, Steve's an atheist." You get a theist watching, and they're like, "Oh, that probably makes more sense," which is weird, right? Because I'm clearly on the skeptic side. I'm clearly more, you know, going to be favoring um, a, a rational approach to things. Because I'm not a theist, right? But that doesn't mean I think that theists have absolutely bad arguments. I just think they're unconvincing. But, right. but you know, you get these atheists out there that don't understand what it means to actually be philosophically an atheist, and they'll say, "Well, <laughs> Steve's is a fence sitter." Then they'll be like, "Well, you know, I just lack a belief." We're in the same position. They don't realize that a lack of belief atheist and an agnostic is logically, syntactically the exact same thing. There is no difference right. logically. Um, it's just epistemically there's difference. So they're just as much of a fence center as an agnostic. And it blows me away when I hear somebody who just says, well, I lack a belief, but you know what? Steve, you're an agnostic, so you don't even take a position. I'm like, well, neither do you. You're not taking a position when you say, I don't believe you. You're not taking a position when you say, I just lack a belief. That is not a position on the proposition. <laughs> okay? No, I do not believe is a non-position. Sorry. And I admit that agnosticism is not a proposition on P either. The difference is, though, it is a sec I think it's more of a second-order belief uh, because I believe that I cannot properly evaluate the proposition. So it's still a belief. Agnosticism is a belief. Stop telling, not you, but out there, stop saying that agnosticism deals with knowledge. It is just a very grossly incorrect way of thinking of agnosticism. There's some truth to it, but it's just not the way people think it is, right? It's one of those things you've got to at least learn about the topic to understand the nuances. But it is a belief right. position. Right. So anyway, Steve, um, uh, I'll give you some. T is there any other spiritual experience you want to point us to, other than the first one that you mentioned? Um, I mean, I've had I've had not spiritual experiences, but like um, like I used to play with a Ouija board a lot um, by myself with other people, and it, it would move, and maybe it was the idiomotive effect. Uh, I I don't know, but uh, uh, but uh, I, it's really weird uh, because I noticed like with a Ouija board, uh, uh, it'll it'll move like a figure eight. Like you know, like 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 a horizontal figure eight, and it would just go really really fast. And I would swear that I wasn't doing that. Maybe I was. I, I'm looking back. I don't know. But other people have had the exact same pattern, and I think that's weird. That what is it about that pattern of a, of a figure eight going um, like a horizontal figure eight? Why is it other people have exact? I've read that other people have the exact same pattern. That to me is still well, something I can't. The devil's explain. probably trying to tell you something. The devil's probably trying to tell you. Uh, to kill eight kids that day or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, wait, so what happened? Tell me about the Ouija board. You, you, were, you were playing with your friends or you were playing by yourself? With oh, them? I used to do both. I used to play the Ouija board for years. Did you really? Why? Just because it was interesting to you? Yeah, I find it to be fascinating because I, I, I don't think that it, I don't think there's any real spiritual component to it, right? I don't think there was any things around. However, I will tell you this one story and I don't think I've ever, I don't know if I told this on air or not. Um, okay. Not to any detail. But I had a friend who basically re got in touch with me not too long ago, um, even though we were friends since high school. But um, one day we were using a Ouija board in um, a, kind of like a community rec center that was in the middle of a complex that I lived in. So you'd have like these condos, and in the middle of the condo was a pool area. In the, in the pool area, there was this little building there with that a rec, little rec center, like a little pool table, right? Some weight sets and some other stuff. Not very big. Right. Well, we were playing the Ouija board in there one day, and this was with um, my other friend, who actually, ironically, is the one that coming down the Sunday, my Mormon friend. 
Um, just coincidence that the store is related. But um, when we played with the board, uh, she was like, I, I, you know, like I don't feel well right now. Um, and her eyes were like dilated. She was sweating, and she felt like something was, was you know, not possessing her. But she felt something was there, right? Uh. And uh, we we said, okay. Um, actually, my friend wasn't there yet. My Mormon friend wasn't there yet. But we call. I called him, and I said, this is before I became Mormon. This was um, an experience that I had. Um, well. Honestly, I don't remember. It was like I was 17, so it was either immediately after I got baptized or before. I don't remember, okay? So bear with me. Right. But, but I have been friends with him since sixth grade, so. Um, but I, call, I, 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 you know, like, okay, he's a spiritual person. Maybe he can figure out what's going on. So I called him up and I said, dude, you, you got to come over here. And um, he, he came over and he, he's like, sat down and kind of looked uneasy, but he's like, okay, what, what's the story? And he's like, well, do you mind if we pray? I was like, knock yourself out. Well, he started to pray, but every other word out of his mouth was like garbled. It sounded like, you know how people get robotic on, on hangouts kind of stuff? It was like yeah. something was choking him. And he just he just got done, and he's like, uh, uh, we need to get out of here. And he, and he, he said you know, something prevented him from praying. Now, to this day, um, we've never really spoken about it. When he comes down Saturday, Sunday, I, I kind of do want to have a talk with him about it. Because my friend that had happened to, because she recently kind of brought this up, just not long ago uh, with me, I asked her, I said, do you actually still that day think that something was around you? Because she's not a believer, right? And she said, yes. And it's kind of surprised me, even to this day, 40 years later, whatever it was, well, 30 years later, um, she still thinks that there was something there, and she's not a religious person. And my best friend, Morris, that's his name, um, who's he's Mormon, who is a spiritual person, even he noticed something. Right, so I've had experiences like that when it comes to weird supernatural experiences. I can't explain, but the right. problem is, is that that doesn't get you to a deity. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't follow, right? Of course, of course. I mean, you're not those. If if you thought those experiences, but those experiences, you don't put them out of the realm of like most atheists would hear something like that, and I can't imagine what they're going to think, but they'll find some naturalistic explanation for it immediately correct which may not be right yes that's true but but it depends on what they're looking for like if you're if you're dealing with science and you have to look for a natural explanation because you have to hear to scientific math uh, methodological naturalism right so science always tries to find a natural explanation to an observer phenomenon but right. if you want to get out of the scientific realm and get into the philosophy and existential stuff because what exists you know is existential that's philosophy then what is it that exists that's causing that if it's not something that is in the natural realm? Right, the, or the metaphysical realm. Is, is it possible that there were they were having legitimate experiences of evil presences that were supernatural in origin? Do you think that's at least possible, Steve? Yes. And do you think it's likely, or do you explain it in a I'm going to just go 50-50 at this point. I have no way of determining one way or another. I, I don't know. Okay, well, at least you're honest. See, a lot of people would, a lot of people would discount it one way or the other because it doesn't conform with their already. I'm not an ontological naturalist, though. I, I'm not an ontological naturalist. I, I'm a methodological naturalist. So naturalism, just in terms of using to explain something scientifically, but you allow for the possibility that there is supernatural realm to life. Is that how I'm understanding it correctly? Yeah, the only thing is, is that when when people say like supernatural, I, I don't know what that means anymore. I, I don't know if there's a firm definition of what it means. Um, if you want to use that as something that's not explainable by known natural things, that may be what it is, right? There might be something that that we just don't know about. And some people have argued, and I think they may argue correctly, that supernatural just means natural we don't know about yet, because I don't know what the line of demarcation would be between natural and supernatural. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm just saying that you allow for the possibility that that is some some form of the spirit realm. Oh, certainly. Sure, why not? Okay. Yeah, I don't discount that off hand. Because I, I, don't I have experiences. Like do, but I don't. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Some automatically offhand and say it can't possibly be the actual spirit realm. There's got to be some completely natural explanation for that. 
Now, I had a lot of experiences like that prior to me becoming a Christian, not necessarily, you know, with demons attacking my friends, but, you know, experiences, experiences like that that could not necessarily be explained other than naturally. And they, they were part of me, you know, pushing me towards becoming a Christian. Because I was like, well, you know, why what, what, what is it about Christianity that you, you said of all the religions out there, um, what particularly was it that said, this is the one I'm going with? Because there's uh, tens of thousands, there's tens of thousands of denominations of, um, of Christianity. Right. I mean, I thought, I how do you know which one to pick, story. right? <laughs> right. I thought I told you the story, though, when I went to church. Uh, you kind of you did. You kind of did touch on it before, yes. Well, I just felt that night very strongly like the Holy Spirit. It's not that dissimilar from what happened to you when you became a Mormon, only a lot more intense. Well, a let me ask more... you this then. Okay, so you, you believe that you did feel the Holy Ghost, right? I Yes. Okay. Um, it's funny because I have related that story before, not so much on air uh, a couple times, but I've, I've talked about it over the last 20 some odd years. When, where, how long how ago? It was 30 years ago, I guess. Wow, it's been a long time. Um, and I've actually not mentioned the details about being Mormon, right? Just, you know, right. this feeling, and I've described the feeling, and people will be like, oh, yeah, that's the Holy Ghost. And then I'll say that it was a Mormon blessing. Oh, it couldn't have been the Holy Ghost. And I'm like, do you not see the problem here? Because they, they don't, they yeah, don't like I, Mormon, I, right? I understand both both the problem that, that I understand both how you see it as a problem, and I understand why they say it, too. So there's, there's, I don't know how to explain this in any sort of coherent way, but if you're trained to think that the Mormon, Mormon is a cult, then you, you're going to think automatically that that can't been a, have been a legitimate experience of the Holy Spirit. You know, there, there are people who will trip out about like Catholics the same way, automatically. Mm -hmm. It's no, kind no, of no, 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 Catholics. My friend, you know, Jay would have never thought that. But she was a lot more liberal Catholic, you know. Right. It depends on how you, it, it depends on a lot of factors. Because if you have it drilled into you, if you, it depends on, on how you've experienced your Christianity also being grown up. Sure. Like if you, if, if you had a hardcore ver version of Christianity and they told you 50 times a day, you know, don't ever become a Mormon or watch out for Mormons or be careful of Mormons. It tells you they had a spirit and they say, well, it was like, it's going to be the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I got to tell you, I, I didn't have a response. I, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I got to tell you, though, I didn't have a single bad experience with the Mormon Church. Um, I have nothing negative to say about any of the people. Um, yeah, the doctrine is, is you know what, is, any more, is it really any more different than any other religion? Not really. I mean, except for Scientology. That's not really religion. But, you know, it's one of those things... I, I, if you're if you're going to believe that a man walked on water and raised from the dead, then is it, is it really hard then to believe that God has a body of flesh and bones that came from the planet? It's not that much of a leaf of faith, but that's irrelevant to the point is that I really liked the people and I had good experiences with the church. Um, nothing nothing relating to, to cultism or anything like that. Um, and people were like, "Oh, well, you're just Stockholm or something." I'm like, "No, I." I, again, I known, since I was six <laughs> years old. No, yeah, no, they were my, you know, my friend and his brother and his mom and his, their dad, just great people, man. And I, I, it really kills me when people just throw out that word cult. And I don't think they'd mean to do it pejoratively per se. I mean, they have their own definitions of cult that I don't use um, because right. I think their their definition is so vague it can include anything. Because I even asked one person that that. Um, thinks Mormon is a cult, and he knows a lot about Mormonism. He really, really does. Um, he's called the Naked, I think it's Naked Mormon. Was that his name? Real, was that his name? I don't remember, but there's a really, really knowledgeable guy on Mormonism. And um, I asked him, I said, according to your definition, the Boy Scouts are a cult. He's like, yeah. I'm like, does it, does it really tell you anything then that is so ubiquitous that can be used for any type of, 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 of organization? No, to me, a cult is, you know, Jonestown, Heaven's Gate, those kind of things, right? Um, I, I I hate I hate to even use it with Jehovah Witness, although I've seen cult like activity with Jehovah Witness, and I definitely think that that Scientology is a cult. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, where you draw the line, it gets hard to say. It gets really really hard to say. But I understand why people have a problem with some of the doctrine uh, that is extra to Christianity. But as most Mormons probably experience Mormonism, it's kind of a variation of reformed christianity not that different from they're they don't live their life on a practical level that much different than an episcopalian 
or something like that because they're, they're, they're you know, they're not really taking the, the parts about it that are weird or out there. They're not really internalizing that and living those on a daily basis. That's where it could potentially become more cult. -like. Does that make sense? What I just yeah. Said? Yeah, no, it, it does, and also kind of show that that certain denominations are more incorporating. Um, for example, like you know, the Catholics would say that you know, well, the Catholics I knew would say the Mormons are, are, are Christians. A lot of Christians, um, you know, exclude certain groups, right? I mean, the fundamentalists, the evangelicals, they're very exclusionary, exclusionary of who they say are Christians, right? It's the no true Christian fallacy, and to me, anybody who who accepts that. Jesus was who he said he was. He rose from the dead and all that stuff. That's a Christian. Now, granted, I may not agree with some of the things they say, but you're not. I, I really hate when people take people's labels away. If I, if I say, "Look, at I believe this. This is who my position," and you're like, "Oh, well, no, it's not." Well, some of that, some of that backfighting between sects gets crazy. I mean, I'll listen to Christians, and then they'll start talking about Catholicism, and they'll start going like, you know, the Antichrist is Catholic, and. and you know, this is this is why Catholicism is is heresy, and they'll, they'll start going off on it. And I'm like, you know, that's completely unnecessary. On um, layman's terms, for of uh, someone who's a practicing Catholic, the things that they believe, you know, they might have some false beliefs baked into the cake, but it's not it's not my responsibility to take it out of them. It's it's irrelevant. You know, how they live their life in, in before God is what's important. Is, yeah, is and, I, and I think that God would be the one that, if, look at it, if God does exist, then i rather let him judge than half the the idiotic fundamentalists that I run into daily. Because if, right. that's the, if that's the person out there that's trying to convince me that God exists, God's not doing a very good job. Because I'm not going to buy into what they have to sell. You know, I much, when I was listening to like my friend Jade, now I'm not a fan of the, the Catholic Church for obvious reasons, but I mean, I loved her to death and I respected her position. Um, but I would sit and listen to her for hours, off air, on air, it didn't matter, because we would have conversations, never got embittered, never got embroiled. The only disagreement we ever had was over Trump, um, and I'm not a fan of Trump. But uh, Or I, I wouldn't even know Trump, because, I mean, we both realized he's shit, but uh, more of a Reagan more than anything else than Trump. Um, she was not a fan of Reagan. I happen to like Reagan. But um, she, I would still listen to her, right, even though she was Catholic, and I would never become Catholic. I still was engaging with conversation with her. And if you can't get engaged in conversation, you're never going to try to sway anybody. So if God wants somebody to convert somebody, having a conversation with them is the only way that's going to happen. And because if you find some asshole out there and some evangelist, that's just going to like tell you you're wrong. You're going to hell. The, the, the backfire effect kicks in. You get in uh, this entrenchment and you're not going in and moving your position. Well, you're it not, not going to listen to them at all. No. You, no. It starts with the real conversation. It's like, for example, one of the things that I thought was probably instrumental in my becoming a Christian is when I was in Italy, I was traveling with my cousin Janine, who was a devout Roman Catholic. Now, my mom's words on her, because she would always be suspicious of her because she's a devout Roman Catholic. So one night we're drinking in Italy, and we, have a, we start having these conversations about religion. Now, I did the same thing that an atheist would do. I started with, uh, well, you guys hate gays, and you know, I started all the injections. But once we got past that, I, we just started having a real conversation about what her faith meant to her. It's so like, wow, this is there's something about this. Like, I got where I'm coming from, and I was like, there's something real about this. You know, once you got past the the societal arguments. Does that make sense? The arguments that are baked into the cake, sort of. Yeah, there's there's certain arguments that, of course, that, that are just not going to go away, unfortunately. Um, and I wish they would. Um, and, and some of the ones I definitely wish would go away is all that stuff dealing with like whole gay people. When you have a bitter uh, theist out there, like you know, like Stephen Anderson, talking about you know killing all the gays and stuff like that, um, that's just that's just pure rhetoric that needs to just die out that needs to be censored by everybody that needs to be rebuked that needs to be um you know chastised and, and them called out for it um there's certain types of dialogue that is just not appropriate in 2018 right and that's it that's one of them i mean you could you can say look at i i don't believe um you know i i don't i'm i'm, I'm not gay i don't believe in gay marriage that that's fine that's your position right but when you advocate violence right. you're done in my book you, there you, you, there is no discussion on that Right. Well, that's that's right. That's not a that's not a rational, reasonable point of view. 
All I'm saying is that when I started talking to my cousin, I took the, the, the point of view of the secular world. I was, the, I was you. I was an atheist. I was like, she's telling me she's a devout Roman Catholic and it means so much to her. And I start off with, well, the church is so anti-gay. You know, defend the church position. And she, you know, she didn't do it all that ad admirably, but I can tell that she's, she herself was not necessarily anti-gay. That was really the important part. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But um, I do got to cut this about short here. I, I uh, my yeah, I was going to show. Uh, by the way, the show is going to be early tonight. Um, we're going to be doing it at three, not five Pacific time. So we're starting in about an hour. Um, All right. So I'll 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 say my little piece and then I'll let you say goodbye. Um, so this went really well, Steve. We we got a little bit into your spiritual experiences, but also, you know, I wanted to just get a much better sense of who you are and what you do and why you do what you do, which I thought really came through loud and clear. So, um, you know, the, like I say to so far, every atheist or every agnostic now is two categories I've had on my show. It's always gone really well. So the door is always open. Mikasa e su casa. You are welcome back anytime. If you want to talk about anything and, uh, you go ahead and say, say your piece and say goodbye. I thought this went really well. Well, I do appreciate it. I'm, I, I'm always uh, thrilled and honored and humbled even to, to be asked to, to do these types of things. Um, doesn't matter the size of the channel. Doesn't matter if you know what the beliefs are, if you can have honest dialogue. And, and you clearly know how to do that. So uh, props to you on that. Um, to the theists that are listening that ever watched this weird video, um, you know, I hope they take something to heart by what I said how to to advance the argument if that's what their goal is um i suspect that the people leaving the comments you know probably will be supportive uh for any atheist out there that you know runs this narrative well steve's just a, an atheist um i recommend just go watching my videos and, and learning about the topic a little bit understanding epistemologically what agnosticism really is about um don't don't call an agnostic uh, an atheist um it's just wrong it's not if, if you want to promote the truth right it, it doesn't matter whether you're an atheist or theist i think both positions want to think that they're promoting truth but when you're promoting something that clearly is not the truth and it's because of ideological positions and we both know this happens we know a lot of theists even do this not in your guys's group but in the you know the the young earth creationists or the flat earth group it, it, i think they're just demonstrable liars um don't 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 be like that um you know if you want to know more about it message me if you want to know more about my musicians you want to know more about the show that we do um please by all means uh, message me i'm happy to try to talk to anybody uh just not why i'm doing this show because <laughs> That's difficult. I get messages like, like exactly like one minute before we go on air. I'm like, I don't really have time for this, <laughs> you know. But anyways, quick, thank you for having me on. Um, again, I do really appreciate it, um, and I'm happy to join you anytime. You got a panel or anything time you want. Somebody just to kind of, you know, run. Yeah, up, man, run come on. Yeah. School is about school is about whatever. School is on science or, or philosophy. And uh, yeah, this was this was Thanks, awesome, buddy. Steve. Thank you for coming on. And thank you, live chat, Shane, Stickman, uh, Casimir. How to go? And, uh, Saigar, all you guys. Thanks for watching this. Peace, peace, people. Peace. And let me cut this. And we.